Um, this talk is going to be a brief explanation, uh, a sort of packaging of this. And in fact, actually, uh, it's a stripped down version of the talk I've just given at ISMB. Um, it is also, all of this is sort of at the pre-preprint stage. So we haven't even written uh, the preprint and put that out yet, but that's sort of the next step. But we had the opportunity and want to get uh, feedback as early as we can. That was always our point because we know, um, even though we had a really wonderful and diverse group, uh, there are many more viewpoints that we may not have captured. And so we wanna make sure that we uh, capture everyone's view. Uh, and there's also going to be a lot of bicycle metaphors, well, at least one, so you'll see where that bicycle comes from. Um, the first thing that I'll start with is a photo of um, a lot of us who were behind uh, developing uh, this set of ideas, uh, including Melissa there virtually. Uh, but this was at a conference that was held back in May uh, 2022, so just recently in Cold Spring Harbor. Um, and then we also originally had planned to have it in 21 uh, virtually, well, in person, but because of COVID that was virtual and then we, we had uh, a real convening later on. And then I'm also putting the names uh, or dwelling on the names of the people in uh, this slide and the next, just to show you the diversity of, of experiences and organizations that were represented. Uh, and so this is the work of many people uh, and lots of experience in this particular area both from the traditional sort of uh, academic setting, but also from people outside of or sort of uh, in parallel with academia. So we were uh, grateful to have them. Uh, and I'll also start by acknowledging NSF because it was their funding that made this meeting possible on uh, this work possible. And also we have some funds. So we're probably gonna do um, if possible, some uh, additional uh, gathering of expertise. So all of that is supported by NSF, but this is not a uh, disclaimer is just saying that it doesn't necessarily reflect the views of NSF. Okay, um, so uh, this is a thought that keeps becoming more and more relevant to me, the more I learn from other people. Um, and I think we have come uh, to assemble some really interesting ideas, but I think no matter how good the ideas are, um, unless we build communities and support people, uh, those ideas will just be ideas on a page. So the, the talk is about, and the, the, article, the, 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 the information I'm presenting is about these ideas, but it's also really about how will we take these ideas and lift them into practice? And what do we need to do that? Because um, it's really going to take a lot of work to make the type of change that we'd like to see. And so we'll need to do that together if we're really to achieve it. So that's just sort of a statement there. I don't think that what we're putting up is uh, something that is designed to just sort of be here, take it and go, but rather here, are you interested, come with us. So uh, the question that goes all the way back to the genesis of this is this idea of, are we wasting time with training? And I hope this is a provocative question. I think every person who does training at one time or another asks them that self because you either, um, feel like there's so much demand and so many needs that it's hard to meet them or you occasionally have a learner and they you know didn't get what they need or you're a learner sometimes and you've taken a course uh, a short course to improve your skills but you really found that you couldn't apply what you wanted to learn afterwards so this is an interesting question and it's not just a sort of anxiety moment but um the paper that sort of started this question in my head was one from 2017 where uh you know, a really good group uh, did a uh, sort of a longitudinal analysis, in this case of US graduate students uh, over many years actually, and trying to figure out for those students that took uh, interventions, short camps, uh, boot, boot camps, workshops, things like that, in that case for computational skills, when they looked at uh, their uh, progress many years later in terms of their skill development, their, their publications, their uh, presentations, et cetera, they didn't find any benefits. They, they found that you couldn't tell the difference. Um, and so this is troubling. At the same time, also putting on our hats as learners, we also know that we have seen wonderful stories of both learners come to us and tell us how they've been able to change. So uh, what's the difference between those two stories? And also at the same time, uh, for me personally, I've been doing a lot of training. These are some uh, points and maps of places that I've been trying to 
uh, work in a project called Cyverse and, and share computational skills and people come to the workshops, am I wasting their time? Am I being less effective? I think everybody is concerned with that who does training. How can we really make sure that what we do is having its intended outcome? Um, another thing that I think we constantly hear the call of is that there's not enough STEM workers. There's a shortage of that. And we, those of us who write grants put that in all every grant. But this is a finding from a group of economists, so that's National Bureau of Economic Research here in the US. And what they actually uh, say is that it's not actually the STEM workers that are, that are uh, scarce. It's actually the STEM skills that essentially, especially in STEM, especially in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, which is the acronym that we uh, often use in the US and other places, uh, you know, the skills that we learn, even as uh, pretty, you know, well-trained experts, uh, within a few years, they can go stale. And you may be in a place where you can't get new skills. And so you either have to stay where you are, or in the case of uh, some people, even leave the STEM workforce. And so it's the technological progress that creates a sense of shortage, not the workers. Uh, in that case, obviously, they're looking at a slightly sense of not necessarily what we think is mainstream academia, but it's part of uh, what we do nonetheless. And I think it impacts all of us. Uh, and the final sort of slide in this set is, you know, we know that people have these demands. This is from uh, earlier work that we did asking NSF funded investigators, what were their biggest needs? And of the uh, dozen or so needs, training were the top three needs that people found uh, that, that they thought, you know, they, they don't, so they don't have a way to meet those needs as scientists. Uh, in their own labs. So how do you combat this? Well, I, I did know, if I didn't know the answer, that you know, building communities is actually really, really important. Um, this is part of what this life cycle trainer is about. Uh, and this is, not to put Melissa on the spot, but I really love questions like this, where somebody can throw a question on Slack, uh, and you know, quickly there's a conversation around it. That's an awesome uh, thing. If, if only for that, um, then, then that uh, is the usefulness of projects like lifeside trainers. But that's, uh, that's great, but there's really more that we could do, I felt, and I think others too, to support a community, not just with a resource to exchange knowledge, but to do something even a little bit more active. And so this uh, presentation on these bicycle principles is really uh, designed, or the premise was to challenge um, the group of people who produced uh, this, this work to think about what principles and what actions could we take to make the type of training that we do in the life sciences for professional development, uh, short format training, how can we make that more effective? How can we make that more inclusive? And also how can we make that career spanning? So really thinking of scientists uh, across, their, across their entire career, they have wonderful things to offer and could they be even better, more high impact science, more achievement of their own personal goals, if there was the right uh, training and support uh, in place to help them uh, every time they needed to build a new skill. And what you're gonna see as I go through it is that there are two sets of principles, uh, one set called a core set of principles and one set called a community set of principles. I'm gonna introduce the principles and then there's a longer part of the talk, which I'm actually not gonna go deep into. There's actually a website for that, which talks about some recommendations that we put forth to actually start moving into something that's really tangible and actionable. So I'll present the principles that'll give us enough to sort of see where things set um, I'll, I'll show you how the, the recommendations are illustrated, and then we can have a little bit of discussion and I'm curious to get some feedback. So um, how do we develop this as a community-driven strategy? Um, well, as I mentioned, uh, we had the, this particular meeting and also, again, highlighting the people that were on the organizing committee. And uh, anytime you're doing a meeting, there's lots of conversations. So there were weekly meetings between myself and my co-PI, Rochelle Trachtenberg from Georgetown. And those meetings look something like this with lots of charts between us and diagrams. This is not meant to be read. So please don't <laughs> take me um, as a bad slide maker. Maybe some of my, my slides are bad, but they're not that horrible that I'd ask you to read something that small. Uh, we had virtual meetings where, as you know, it's not a meeting until you have multicolored sticky notes asking people what they think. And so we had that stage too. 
And then the final stage of our meeting was actually the in-person. And for those that were there, it was held underneath the blood moon eclipse. So I don't know if that's like a portent or whatever it is, but it was nice to be in person and actually just sit and think and discuss till late nights of the hour uh, about the problems. And so that generated a really nice set of principles. So uh, principles have been around for a long time since Trotman Heston or even earlier, uh, that if you take 10 things and put them down, sometimes people will listen to them. So um, that's where we're gonna start from. So the first core principles are four principles and they are something that we think every single short format training should strive for or should consider when you're designing it. And the very first one of, this, uh, of these principles is best evidence, that we should ground our instruction in findings from education science. Um, might seem, I hope, a bit obvious. I hope it's something that we want to do, but it's actually not something that we always do. And that's particularly because in a lot of uh, circumstances, uh, the training is really driven by experts in a particular science domain who might not themselves have expertise in teaching. And so it's really actually worth stating that there is a whole wealth of knowledge from the education sciences. But also the reason why we just didn't say formal education science is because there are also a lot of great experience and knowledge that comes from training programs, but that's not always shared. Uh, sometimes this stuff gets published but there are a lot of people that have been doing this for years and even have evidence to back themselves up because they have done uh, different types of evaluation. But you may not know or that may not be accessible sometimes, but it is there and we should make an effort to learn from it and collate it. So whatever the best available evidence is, that's what we should be using. And we should make an effort to, uh, as a community to move in that direction. Now, the second of four core principles is this uh, new term that we're using called catalytic learning. Uh, it's a new term, and for those people who are familiar with the education sciences, we could go into it. It's defined on the website. I'll show you later. But essentially, it really means that we should actively think about how we prepare learners to succeed when what we're teaching them actually requires further study for them to be effective. So there are some forms of training. I guess we would call it just-in-time training, where the training is really about press button one, then button two, then button three, and you're done. Sometimes that's what you need. You just need to go through a, a, a website or watch a couple of videos, and that's about it for the specific skill. But other times, the types of training that we are doing are really complex sets of knowledge, skills, and abilities. Uh, it could be learning to become an open scientist, uh, being able to start to apply uh, elements of bioinformatics or data science. And now that now that's a whole constellation of skills and knowledge and things that you would need. And you're not gonna get that from one workshop uh, in, in, in most cases, right? But can we think about how to actively prepare learners so that they understand what the expectations are from this workshop and they leave the workshop with a map of what are the next steps you'll need to take and also, what are the next steps that you'll need to take given what your goals are? Because there's a lot of noise out there. There's tons of learning material. There's tons of education out there. But if you as a learner don't know how to sort through it, you're either gonna give up or spend time on things that aren't really beneficial. So this idea of catalytic learning is a strategy that we hope to elaborate further um, in thinking about how we can help instructors to prepare learners when really they need a lot more than we can give them, but we can give them an excellent start. The third of four core principles is to be effective. And what we mean by that is actually to provide evidence, either from assessment or from valuation, to learners that they have made progress in achieving uh, either programmatic or learning goals. So uh, in short format training, we often are a little bit nervous, and so are learners, to ask questions and do assessment and do evaluation. We often do some form of those things, um, but a lot of times, for example, when we do surveys at the ends of workshops, how did you like the workshop? Do you feel prepared? Uh, these are measures of learner confidence, but they're not necessarily assessments that can really uh, test whether the learner has um, mastered or at least really gotten to a, the next step or the next level in their understanding. Uh, what are some ways that we can do it, but also how can we make that achievable for the instructor? Because there's so many balances at play there's not a lot of time, um, but how can we actually become more quantitative or qualitative in how we provide evidence to the learner that, hey, you couldn't do A before, but now you can do A. And you know, on the next step, you'll, you'll go for B. And that might be a learning goal, but a programmatic goal might be something 
are we actually succeeding at being inclusive? Did we ask the learner, did you feel included? Or did we do a whole bunch of things that we thought would be inclusive, thought we would, we would increase accessibility, but we never actually measured that. Uh, so it's really about measuring things and providing evidence to the learners and to ourselves. Uh, and, and we explain uh, a little bit more about why we think that that's something everyone should try to do. And the final of four of these core principles is to be inclusive. And it really speaks to uh, inclusion not being as uh, nice to have, but an absolutely critical component of what we wanna do from the moment we start designing. Now, these principles, as we'll come back to later, are iterative and they feedback on themselves. So these are things we always get better at, but we do wanna make sure that we include these core principles. The next set of principles, there's three more, are community principles. And these principles seem to come into play when you actually have groups of people, when you are actually taking a training course and it's more than one person or one individual group, but you're actually thinking of making that training course extend across time that it needs to continue. Perhaps you're not gonna be teaching it next year, but the next group is, or you're reaching other institutions with that training, or you're putting it online. Any of those things might be places where now you need to think not just about the moment of succeeding and training 20 people that are in front of you now, but actually as you get bigger. So the three principles at play there are this idea of reach. How do you include new types of learners and larger audiences, right? So you may have known how your training materials work with the people at your institution that you normally teach. Uh, what might you need to think about differently if that training actually needs to be disseminated to a larger audience? The next one is scale. And that is concerning not the learners that, that themselves, but actually the instructors and instructional developers. So these are the people, the instructors who actually deliver the training. And in many cases, you'll also have instructional developers who design courses and support the instructors in delivery. How do you train the trainers essentially uh, so that when you scale things out, what was possible for you at your institution can be made possible for other people at other institutions or other contexts um, than what you might have originally planned for or imagined. And the final of the community principles is the idea of uh, sustain, making things sustainable. How can you make things available, usable, relevant, and reliable uh, beyond what you, you immediately had started out with? How can we support infrastructures, communities of trainers, so that we can continue to extend things, but without breaking them? Because oftentimes when you disseminate, uh, you, you sort of give the work away, but it may not necessarily be replicable by other people without some additional thought and effort and support. So those are the principles. And as we said, um, they can be the unicycle, which is, listen, we're just doing something that's more well-scoped. It's just for this institution, just for this time, just for this certain group of people. This should always apply. And you can ride a unicycle. I'm not particularly good at unicycle. I've never read, ridden one, so I just imagine I'm not going to be good at it. But uh, it can work. You can go somewhere on a unicycle. And then the bicycle is really when you are thinking about a community and you're going further. And as we said, these are, one is not more important than the other. They are iterative. They feed into one another. So a cyclic sort of structure is what came to mind and hence the bicycle. Okay, so I am going to stop in about, well, less than five minutes. Uh, I'm just going to illustrate these recommendations and then move on to the website where we elaborate on this, point some features out, and then really have a little bit of conversation uh, and discussion. So uh, this is the bottom up versus the top down 10 commandments. The bottom up is a sort of a Martin Luther 95 thesis type of thing where you have grievances about what you'd like to see in training. We don't have 95 recommendations, so only 14. Uh, when I first presented these recommendations at the ISMB meeting, our subsection is called BOSC, which is this pair. Uh, and so if you're not familiar with all of these AI artificial drawing things, it came to mind that a lot of our recommendations are pretty not visual, but yet on a slide, I don't want to present you with just uh, words. And to encourage the audience to pay attention to my slides, 
uh, I gave a writing prompt to the AI and asked it to come up with images to support these really esoteric concepts. And it really fit with the mood because uh, it's an open source project. Uh, I no longer have to hunt for video uh, for images on the web that are copyrighted. And so I'll at least show you the first one or two of them because it's something to get people to pay attention to 14 slides of mostly words, although it's one sentence each, gives you an idea of something to go for. Uh, the first image, I'll pay attention to the image, was of a scientific conference painted by Van Gogh. And I don't know, maybe those are scientists up there. They look kind of strange, but I've seen some strange people going to conferences. And the bottom right does look like the overpacked pre-COVID conferences that I'm used to going to. So maybe something like that. Uh, two letter A, which is the recommendation, uh, the idea came to mind uh, of, do we need to professionalize the training of short format training instructors and instructional designers? Would it be valuable for people who are trainers to have some sort of professional society or even chapters within existing societies that they participate in who could help disseminate and propagate uh, practices that are effective? Uh, that could help uh, share things like the bicycle principles. Um, for each recommendation, I'm just giving you the introductory sentence and I'll move to the website to show you that we have a description of how might this work? Uh, what might be some benefits to the learners? What might be incentives to people to implement this? And what might be barriers? So we'll get into those in a moment, but I'll show you one or two uh, more of these and then we'll go into the website just as in the illustrations, I won't waste them. Uh, this idea of a centralized infrastructure, I asked for a steampunk punk drawing of infrastructure, and it gave me the thing on the right. I think that kind of looks like tubes and things, so maybe. Um, but the idea came to mind with recommendation B, is that um, would it be a way to reduce the burden on instructors and short format training if there was a central resource that you could turn to for assessment and evaluation? instead of doing it all yourself, or maybe in some cases people hire a contractor, could there be a place where you could go and for almost any short format training uh, project uh, course, regardless even of your topic, would there be subsets of questions or question banks that you could go to that would actually be reusable, uh, that would be validated, that could tell you some metrics about your course that you'd like to have, that could take care of things like long-term assessment, which are really difficult to do, but that a separate service that is paid to do it uh, or supported or funded to do it uh, could go to, and that learners could also rely on that it would be an impartial and independent source. Um, centralizing infrastructure could be an example of something that would support the principles. But let me go back into in my last two or three minutes here, the website to actually show you a little bit how this plays out and then give you an idea of how we hope uh, we could move to next steps on this. So all of these things have been collated into our first dissemin dissemination activity, which is this website, um, bikeprinciples.org. And on this website, um, we've laid out essentially what I put in my slides, uh, a little bit of background along with references uh, for the rationale behind the principles, a statement of the principles. And you'll also notice that in many cases, um, terms that we use are hyperlinked to a glossary. So if you're not exactly sure how we're using a term, uh, you can see the definition also again, often with references to explain what we mean or what we thought we meant. Um, there's also a credit and recommendation, uh, credit uh, to the group. So that's on the first page. If you move through the website, I'll just go to the next page. There's next buttons there. It gives you an introduction and it shows you the six descriptive features that are available, um, a summary, how this might work, related principles. So we try to desc describe all the recommendations in a consistent format. Uh, next, the website is also a type of survey in the sense that every single recommendation, uh, this is sort of our uh, consenting form, Every single recommendation has a survey question attached to it. Uh, and so you can answer as few or as many of those as you want, uh, but we do wanna be you know, uh, in line with ethical practice. And for the recommendations I presented and the other uh, 12 more recommendations, uh, there's a quick summary of what those recommendations, what, what it means, uh, a little bit of background, uh, references, how this might work, related principles, and then uh, sort of a bullet point list, a short list of uh, 
benefits to learners, incentives according to different stakeholders that might care about this, and barriers. And at the end is a survey question where you can say how you'd like to give us feedback. It's totally anonymous, but we'd like to know what perspective you're coming from as a learner, as an instructor, et cetera. And then how do you rate the um, benefits to learners? How do you rate the incentives to implementers? So on and so forth. So each one of these, A through N, uh, has uh, that same format, gives you an idea of what that recommendation is about, followed by, again, the survey question. And then at the last page of the website, well, towards the end, uh, there's the glossary and definitions, which is always accessible, but then there's also this page on community feedback and next steps. So we will be posting there a place where you could at least see what's coming next. I hope that we'll be holding some focus groups and some more asking community members to come together as a group uh, for an hour. We may have, I hope, actually some funds to support that and to ask people to choose three or four of these that they'd like to discuss uh, and then really get feedback because we want to know um, what people feel about these. And also we are very interested in recommendations we ha haven't thought of. We're very interested in groups that are doing some of these things that we haven't interacted with or haven't learned from because these recommendations are starting point. They're not really where this ends. Um, the next steps after that collection period will also include additional publications. And then also on the website, there is a feedback form People can start uh, conversations. Uh, they can uh, you know, add their voice in a more public way than an anonymous survey. And there's also a, a mailing list, which if you wanna get an update when something new is available. I'll also mention back on the homepage that the website is already citable. So there is a citation and there's a note link for people who want to at least be able to sort of reference this and start to bring it up. 